I don't want to get given medals, but I can invite you to speaking engagements, but this is a distinguished historic medal. I read all about it, very distinguished institution, and I shall take good care of it and put it somewhere where I can see it every now and again, and uh, thank you very much indeed. And, uh, I'm told you don't give every speaker you have a medal, so I... <laughs> So I'm now underway, am I? Um, uh, right, well, I, I, generally, I, I'm not being too lighthearted. It's very nice of you to give me a medal, and I saw all the it very carefully. It's uh, uh, just because uh, for Trinity, a great institution like Trinity College Dublin, to invite a, uh, a veteran British politician and at least uh, pay some for a nominal tribute to the fact that. The only one non-controversial thing about my career, my longevity of my career, and the remarkable range of things I've done over the years, is very kind, and I, I, I do appreciate it. Um, my understanding is that it's time to speak to you about current politics, and uh, you'll realise I suffer from the problem which every active British politician suffers from at the moment, which is we have one elephant in the bath, we have one subject, which is rendering the government almost powerless and incapable of doing anything else but wrestle with it, uh, which is the subject of Brexit. And I thought, therefore, particularly when I was told that Nigel Farage was your last guest here, uh, that, that I should uh, address that. And it's a suitable thing to address. And I'm uh, lucky enough to be able to make the, a trip like this to Dublin, which I have done over the years quite frequently. Uh, because I realise it's as important to the Republic of Ireland as it is to the British, actually. It has huge implications here. And with my, my host, with Lillian Oswald, well, we've, we've been agreeing that the English politicians have almost been taken by surprise by the Irish dimensions of the problem, which they did shamefully neglect at an early stage of the debate and still are not facing up to properly. So I'll touch on that as well, because I think that's important. The difference with Brexit, is perhaps not so much in Dublin, uh, certainly back in England, is it's been around so long that it, it, you know, it's difficult to know what to address without actually just uh, repeating what has been around for a long time. I, I, I'm not going to sit here giving you a pro-European speech. Any of you who have ever heard of me, followed my career in any way, know that I am a very hardline pro-European conservative, uh, I have been for my life. Um, the first parliament I entered was, uh, I won a Labour seat to help give Ted his majority in 1970, uh, and the parliament was the parliament which we entered the European community. I played a minuscule bank carrying role. I was in the government whips office, trying to negotiate a majority for the European Communities Bill, which of course we did not have a party majority for, the imperialist right wing of my party was opposed, Enoch Powell was one of the most formidable opponents of our membership. We relied on what were then the Jenkinsites, what you nowadays call the Blairites, uh, who gave us a big majority in principle, and in hours, days, weeks of carrying the bill, uh, I found myself negotiating with some of the younger members of the Jenkinsites, because I knew the young ones better than any of my colleagues, negotiating how many Labour MPs were going to fail to turn up tomorrow, because they were to stay in the committee to give us a majority. I'm not going to go back much further, but that just shows the irony, the symmetry of my career. My first parliament was when we joined the European community, and this almost certainly my last parliament is the one where we leave it. Uh, and actually, a very large number of the arguments are remarkably similar. I, I do think I've heard quite a lot of this before. It was the, the hard left and the hard right against the centre right and the centre left then and the centre left and the centre right one then, but unfortunately we've uh, complicated matters with the referendum now. Uh, the reasons, just so briefly, I, mean, I won't tell you what, why was I pro-European? -pro I was so pro-European that as I started as a student. My first Conservative Party conference was when Harold Macmillan was Prime Minister, and it was the one where he was trying to defend his decision to apply for membership of the European Community, and people like me and John Gummer went round with big pro-European badges on. They, 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 I believed, after the debacle of Suez, and the fact that the British had completely failed to discover any role in the world after the Second World War, that, that the British needed to join the modern world. Stop pretending we were still some sort of imperial power 
manning the Suez Canal to keep open our passage to India. Uh, I stopped saying that we'd won the war, so therefore the world opened us living and owed us living and being indignant that we were being left behind by countries like Germany and France, which were overtaking us economically. Uh, and the European community, the Chilean concept, all that was the thing to be, we did, and I think it worked. Uh, my views never wavered. I think we benefited hugely from 40 odd years of membership. We have had a much more powerful voice as a self-confident nation in an ever more complicated modern world <coughs> is what gives us a bit of extra clout in defending our interests, promulgating our values, is we are one of the leading members of the European Union. The bloc gives all of us added strength and importance. The British, particularly important to the Americans because of the particular relationship we have with them as one of the leading members, therefore taken more notice of by most European American presidents, and I think taken more seriously by our rivals, by the fact that we in this bloc. Our economy, we benefited from the common market, we didn't amount to much, uh, and once the Thatcher government had succeeded, because we, we were in always the lead in the European Union uh, on economic liberal reforms, that was the British bit, really, where our views did, we did eventually give a bit of momentum to things, usually with the support of the Irish Uh And uh, the single market, uh, I, I think, owed a lot to the work of the Thatcher government and our diplomats and officials. After that, not the only reason why Britain has been extremely prosperous for the last few years, uh, but I mean, that was one of the major contributions. We were now a member of the biggest multinational free trade bloc in the world, not a complete one. We were pressing on with getting more EU free trade deals with other countries, with the British very keen on them. Uh, we're still trying to extend the single market to services properly and all the rest of it. But we're in the forefront of that, and I think that demonstrated the value of the European Union. Of course, we never to waver in my views, but I've just given you with the mainstream views of any member of the British Conservative Party until nearly two years ago, uh, when I'm one of the few that didn't see the light on the road to Damascus. Uh, we had this ludicrous decision to hold this referendum. Uh, it has shattered the political situation uh, in Britain, uh, and uh, it has you know, caused quite a major crisis. It takes only one part of an historic turning point in the way most of the democracies of the Western world are now working. You know, the Trumps and the Bens, uh, hopefully he favours, but I won't get into all that. In Britain, it has caused quite the biggest shambles I've ever seen in my life. Uh, the politics of the United Kingdom are frankly mad, but grappling with huge issues, which if you're a veteran doing your last parliament, at least I think, uh, I would say, it's, uh, my temperament's obviously very peculiar, it could be an historic disaster, you know, thwarting everything I would have wanted to see. Uh, but you never know, it, it is interesting. I, I don't go to the House of Commons thinking, uh, what am I still doing this for, being here, done that, why don't I go clown around in the House of Lords? and all that is. <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't uh, miss any of this for the world, uh, although it is very difficult to make a difference in it. Why is it so chaotic? Well, some of this is very familiar. That's because everybody, every expert, in quotes, and every politician knew that Remain was going to win. Uh, and no attention was paid by anybody, on or off the platform, uh, to what exactly leave would mean, what the alternative was going to be to membership with the European Union uh, once, uh, if we voted Remain. I mean, Boris Johnson was as shocked as David Cameron as the votes were counted. Nigel Farage had gone to bed, making some brief statements saying the struggle continues and it had to be woken up to be told he'd won. Uh, and the, the, the level of political discussion that far had just been about on that level. Uh, so there was no preparation, no agreement, no two leavers agreed with each other, no two remainers altogether agreed with each other about if we left what we would do. And we've been struggling in it ever since. And there, 
a, a, a huge number of highly <coughs> complex issues uh, upon which, uh, with, with which public involvement is quite limited. The passions have been raised to an extraordinary extent. And once you start, the one we've mainly got into at the moment are the economic and trading relationships, but that's only the beginning. Once you start bringing in the single market and the customs union, subjects which were never mentioned during the referendum campaign, which I think two-thirds of members of parliament on the day of the referendum campaign could not have accurately defined to you, saying what the difference was, and most members of the public don't quite know what we're talking about now. But once Theresa made the fatal decision to, to put the first clarity and what Lee meant with that appalling Lancaster House speech where she defined it as leaving the single market and leaving the customs union and repudiating the ECJ, really, uh, that were the catamounts pigeons, but that there hadn't been a Leave position on anything. Uh, and that has put the catamounts pigeons has ever since, because it's a fairly disastrous statement. Uh, and uh, the, the Conservative Party, having a ferocious war, which it has on and off for 25 years, but never like this, uh, about, uh, most of them again, they're given a religious force, the result of the referendum, which is ordered by the people to do all kinds of funny things, which I don't regard myself as ordered by the people to do. We have uh, bound by the Lancaster House speech and its red lines, which were red lines nobody ever consulted me about. Nobody, I've never heard anybody say that's what leaving the European Union meant before. Uh, but then everybody tries to fit into their positions around those. And uh, the, the, uh, most of the remainers are trying to get the single market and the customs union and everything but name because they want the benefits of the free trade arrangements. The leavers uh, want the complete access to the market, they want to affect the benefits of the single market and the customs union, but we're leaving because we're not going to be bound by any of the obligations or the rules that are attached to that. And if the Europeans won't just let us carry on selling our goods and services according to our standards into their market without any obligations, that's because they're foreigners and they dislike us and they're punishing us and they're being unreasonable. And so, that's rather unkindly parody in my opponent's uh, position, but that is roughly what they are. So far, we have got nowhere in resolving even that dilemma. Uh, you've no doubt timed your invitation, knowing what was going to happen and that you'd have me in the afternoon following two days of intensive talks in the Cabinet uh, Committee, which was going to resolve these matters and produce a British position on the outcome. Uh, I don't think they'll ever agree. Uh, and they're uh, sort of hopelessly divided. Again, it's a problem with Parliament. If both parties, the big parties, are hopelessly, hopelessly divided. The full range of views on Europe. Those like mine, all the way over to Nigel Farage, is represented in the British Cabinet, led by Theresa May, the only person whose views are not altogether clear. In the opposition Labour, Labour Shadow Cabinet, full range of views, absolutely the same range. They are led by hard lines. Brexiteer, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, John McDonnell. I've never known two more fierce opponents of the whole European project in the many years I've spent with uh, Jeremy in Parliament. Highly consistent, like every Benite. Which Ben was one of the great opponents of the EU in my youth. It's capitalist, it's designed for big business, uh, it doesn't allow you to take it to state control, those parts of the economy you wish to if you're running a proper, respectable socialist command economy. You can't subsidize your favorite industries. Uh, you can't just put tax work barriers uh, against uh, what you regard as unfair competition from more modern industries abroad. Absolutely appalling. They've always voted for leaving. 
Uh, unfortunately for the Labour Party, 80% of the Parliamentary Labour Party are pro-European. Uh, a great majority of those as pro-European as I am. Uh, but they're locked for all kinds of internal reasons into the leadership of a group who, who are diametrically at odds uh, with the bulk of their followers in Parliament. Uh, and actually, what complicates matters is Corbyn has these people who make me nostalgic. There were lots of 60s leftists when I was young. Uh, these are slightly different sort of 60s leftists, but they're not they are, they're, they're that sort of thing. They're, they're young, very idealistic left wing, and I'm not being scoffed at all. just said uh, uh, never got to me after about the age of 17. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, but this lot are different from the ones I used to know. They're very pro European, which is a complication to Mr. Corbyn uh, and Mr. McDonald. So, the only reason the Labour Party doesn't have such difficulty in agreeing a policy is it's not in government, so it doesn't have to spread it out quite so much, and it doesn't need one quite so much. They are having, say, ferocious internal arguments about what they should actually vote for <coughs> if and when we get round to uh, a final deal. So that is my no doubt unhelpful description of why, from over the Irish Sea, I'm quite sure our political debate at the moment is rather hard to follow. In Ireland, the one thing that matters, of course, is the Irish border and what this is going to do to Ireland. Uh, uh, and uh, that takes me on to withdrawal agreement, because we are trying to go through this systematically. And we all agree the logical thing is the British should ask to withdraw, so the first thing we have to agree is the withdrawal agreement. Uh, that involves reaching agreement on the rights of EU citizens and the rights of British citizens in the rest of the EU. The amount of money that we were morally and legally bound to pay because we committed to it in budgets already, and how we would calculate the money we would continue to pay for any involvement in institutions in future as a third party country. And then was added the Irish border. Uh, now the first two uh, could have been settled in half an hour. Uh, but because of the divisions in the British government, it took about 18 months uh, before we got to blindly obvious conclusions. And you know, the money was put off because oh, we work with these methods. So how are you going to calculate it as it occurs in the tetragrams? We've got a way of calculating that. The silly media try and put a figure on it. But fortunately, they can't. Uh, 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 and, uh, and there was the Irish border, which I, I, I hate to say, the vast majority of the British public had never thought of, nor had their political class. Uh, I don't know whether whichever bright spark inspired the Prime Minister to give the Lancaster House speech was anybody who had ever had any dealings with the Irish border. But it is hardly surprising that this was raised uh, and, it, it, and it had to be settled as a withdrawal. And I personally think, I hope, personally, I hope the Irish government stick to their things. They, they did eventually get an agreement which every ultra Euro skeptic went back to London the next day saying, oh, it's not legally binding, it's just a piece of paper, nothing's agreed, it's all over, and all that kind of thing. Regulatory convergence, if you can't get any other satisfactory thing, is there, and I think it's got to be insisted on, and the dark behaviour of Euro skeptics has led to the Commission demanding it's put into a legal form, so we can't slide back on the withdrawal agreement. But it's not a complete solution, because it is very difficult. Um, the, the, then we go, the next thing we've got to agree now is the transition. Again, that should have been resolved by now. Uh, if you've got some half sensible diplomats and politicians together from both sides of the channel who never had any dealings with the European Union and sit down on Monday. By Tuesday they'd have said the obvious thing is, for so long as you're in transition, you remain in exactly the same arrangements as we I think she kind of made that policy, although Boris tried to unsettle the speech by giving a speech he was in about two days before it, and then he wrote a funny article about two days later, but he was supposed to have agreed to it. Uh, and, and, and I think by the beginning of next week, we, certainly by March, we should have a transition agreement. 
then you get on to the serious stuff of what you are going to do. Now, I take the position, on this, you may gather I'm very cynical about all of this, but that's just my, I, I just a veteran politician getting cynical and indulging in far too much unhelpful black humour to the father or whatever uh, about the whole thing. But it is, I don't think I've said anything inaccurate in my own opinion, in my description of where we are. Uh, well, when you get to the final uh, stages, I am more pessimistic than most other English Remainers about the prospects of our reversing the whole thing and, and uh, actually deciding to stay in the EU after all. Nothing would delight me more. But it strikes me that the political class have completely burnt their boats. The, had the referendum gone the other way, the leaders would have taken no notice of it. We had that in the 1970s. Binding. Um, but once they won, they've been triumphalist, and with the help of the right wing press, they have seized the moment. Uh, and it's become, it's got, it's got a religious quality, it's, it's a binding code. Uh, when I say that uh, I've not heard anybody give me a sane reason why the British are proposing to leave your atom, I, I get solemnly lectured that my masters, the people, have ordered me to vote for leaving your atom. In the referendum, by the referendum result they gave. And I'm arrogant when I say that my perfectly respectable, intelligent, sensible, I, I represent a fairly prosperous, well educated constituency, and I respect their views, but the greatest respect, I don't think nine out of ten of them ever heard of your atom. And, and, and that, I don't think they didn't do it. Oh, you can't go back on that. And, and if you do get in the way of a hard line, Eurosceptic agenda, as the, the hardliners slowly develop what their agenda is, which has taken them quite a long time. They're getting very hard now on single market, and, they, uh, and, and, and they'll probably start getting very hard on arrest warrants and Europol and all kinds of things. Will be finished. Uh, the the, 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 um, the, the right wing media, who are in a, everyone should really ignore, are in their elements, and they, they particularly steer. The voluntary Conservative Party members. Uh, they're the people still who read it, I think, the Telegraph and the Mail, well, most of their leadership. But um, so if, if you do start challenging the referendum, which means challenging Boris, um, you, you, you're an enemy of the people, you're a traitor, you're, 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 you're all the rest of it. Uh, and and the, the people who do decide to start trying to use Parliament to check this are subject to great abuse. Ironically, the Labour Party has the same thing. Uh, one thing that the new young left have in common with the <coughs> old young left of my day is they're intolerant and fanatic. So they're busily starting to purge uh, half their members of parliament. Um, and, and, and so members of parliament are gripped <coughs> by the more respectable that practically all of them, apart from aged eccentrics like me, promised their constituents they would obey the result of the referendum. Most of them because they were utterly convinced that Remain was going to win. Uh, and they're not bound by that, and they will quite rightly be ridiculed and attacked if they go back on that. Uh, and they're also terrified of their, the voluntary members of their own party. And they're terrified of the hysterical right-wing newspapers. Because they will have to run the gauntlet of fire, you know, if, if, if uh, they do start trying to resist all this. So I think we are going to leave. But the details are still up for grabs. Not least because neither government nor opposition has its faintest notion uh, what details they're actually contemplating putting in place. Uh, uh, my hope, therefore, I'll stop going on, because I've got frankly earned this, so I realize going on. But the, this is a big, big issue, subject, a serious subject. Uh, the, the, we need something like the single market that is reasonably free of barriers that isn't called the single market. Uh, we need something like the customs union, a customs union, a customs arrangement, slips into speeches occasionally, uh, which isn't the customs union. Uh, and uh, we need slowly to start preparing for keeping 
actively involved with some of the important institutions in the field of security, policing, uh, environment, and lots of other areas which we haven't even got around to looking at yet, including, as the Vice Provost reminded me beforehand, a rather important matter of cooperation between universities, the impact on academic life in the United Kingdom and elsewhere, and so on. Um, and, and that's all to play for. It's as much all to play for all those things as they were, you know, beginning of last week, and no doubt we'll have more vital meetings next week. Vital meetings next week, but they're even opening things which look like they can't even agree things which are needed for the transition agreement. If we start trying to say, well, we're going to have a transition agreement, we'll carry on as we are now, except that we don't like your citizens, so we're not going to give them the rights we used to when they come to live here. Uh, and uh, if you change any of the rules, we're going to take no notice of them. We'll still take, our airplanes will still fly across Europe, we'll just won't take any notice of any new rules we brought in and so on. It's going to take a long time to negotiate a transition agreement, and we're going to need a very long transition agreement. Both sides of the channel are talking about getting heads of agreement by October. Privately, it's slipped to December with most of them. I've never heard, my, my, you remind me of this, if I'm wrong, I hope I am, if you need on it, but I've never heard such rubbish in all my life. Uh, we, 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 uh, we need a long transition agreement, as we are. First one, that will ease the Irish border problem. Eventually, we do need, at the Irish border, uh, an open border. We, we, the, the Good Friday Agreement is a serious agreement. I personally think Sinn Féin, at the moment, not honouring it in practice because of the increasingly extraordinary reasons they keep finding for not resuming an executive role <coughs> in the North. Uh, I don't think the British government should just say, well, it's frightfully inconvenient, uh, and so it'll only be a bit of a border, won't it? Uh, <laughs> as we start having tariffs, different customs, uh, various customs checks, uh, that uh, we're going to have uh, regulatory divergence with different product standards, different uh, standards either side of the border, which is a border. Uh, and it will need to be manned, and everybody who has the well being of the preserving that remarkable peace we've achieved in Northern Ireland should not be so irresponsible as to start fooling about. The, uh, the last uh, minister, I'm afraid, tried to persuade me it was possible that a private conversation. Uh, he said, well, it's all right, we, the British government will just have to agree not to collect the tariffs. Uh, it'll cost the exchequer a bit, but it'll be worth it to keep the Irish quiet. Uh, um, well, well, that's a theory, but unfortunately, he's a perfect he does understand uh, that it isn't just tariffs, it's modern trade agreements that have other things about origins of goods, customs procedures, and particularly, you can't have a trade agreement with any other country that doesn't have a degree of regulatory convergence on the products and the services you're going to trade in. So, um, it, it's all to play for, and somebody like me in England regards the pressure from the Republic of Irish politicians, including your government, on action, which Barnier and the other 26 are responding to by apparently going to demand that because of all the stupid remarks made by right-wing Englishmen the day after the withdrawal agreement, that they want it put into legal form before they'll go much further. I regard that as very welcome because I think any responsible politician should want to do it. Should be responsible as well, I'll conclude now, because I regard one of the Europe mildly contributed. One of the best things in my political career is the wholly transformed relationship <coughs> between Britain and the Republic of Ireland. Uh, I mean, not just, just sitting here saying the convention of nice things. I, I think when I started in politics, Ireland was a rather one-off in the rest of Europe. It was a strangely rather isolated, old-fashioned place that had its own politics that was not very engaged with anywhere else very much. Uh, and certainly not the English. Uh, and that was a very nice place. I don't know, first came here when I was still at school, I think. But, uh, but it was a different sort of society, otherwise. It, it, it was about as successful as engaging with the modern world as the United Kingdom, my youth looked like being as well. 
Sean Lamas and people with the kind of Irish politicians I began to admire as they started to modernise it. And I think membership of the European Union gave the Irish a role in the modern world and it gave the Irish the basis for a modern economy. And Ireland, everything has changed because we've lived long enough in 50 years, all societies changed a lot. But Ireland is now thriving. We were all completely screwed up by the Financial crisis of 2007, Ireland more than we were. The greed of bankers, the incompetence of regulators, the indifference of politicians, and we all had the longest, worst recession since the war, and the whole capitalist system nearly got upset, and we've all still got to rethink the lessons of that. But the European element, we've got it underway again. We've got to have some uh, do something about it, make sure our regulators never make the same mistake, be prepared for similar mistakes. Meanwhile, Prospects are great. The Irish, with whom we've never been an enmity in my lifetime, have probably become our closest allies in the European Union. I've never, never known such warm relationships between the ministers of the Republic of Ireland and the ministers of the United Kingdom, regardless of the politi political parties in power, as we've had in the last 10, 15 years until the referendum. And for both of us, I haven't changed my mind, given up reminiscing now, I've been talking about current events most of the time, looking forward, I think the benefits of the European Union are even more screamingly obvious than they were when I was young. This is a very dangerous time. We have huge political issues in common with all the other 27 European members. <coughs> the American alliance is still there, very important. We've got to cement it. But is it quite so reliable as it was? Are we all adjusted to a President Trump being someone to whom we can actually leave all our main defence responsibilities, to be sure that he will look after us and our interests when we need them? And he will use his defence powers in ways which, which we will always be comfortable. I don't think so. President Putin is a highly successful, very nationalist adventurer quite determined to re-establish his influence in Central and Eastern Europe in a way which is quite disruptive and damaging to our interests. We all face the threat of mad, crazed, jihadist terrorism, a fanatic religious movement which hates us and which has followers who see part of the purpose <coughs> to destroy the Western world, Western values, and uses terrorism to pursue it, quite apart from all our political interests in all the anarchy and disorder of the Middle East, which in part, in my opinion, our invasion of Iraq tended to exacerbate and which we haven't remedied very much since. Their problem is that if the Europeans had to have 28 separate approaches to that, it would be farcical. They would not count for tons in the modern world. We need to actually concentrate on where we can agree, how we best pursue our mutual interests and our mutual values in restoring democratic order in this dangerous world and look forward to a day when the great powers of the world in my grandchildren's time will be China, the United States, India, Brazil and the European bloc. Many of the European bloc have gone isolationist as the UK is threatened to at the moment, and the Europeans will be a bit of a sideshow and not count for very much. And as for our economy, we've got to address the failings of capitalism, why the economic liberal establishment of the 1990s did not realise that the benefits weren't being shared properly in many societies, and to understand the risks better as well than just allowing wild market folly uh, loose as we did in the 2000s. But I still think, uh, that we have a, you know, the, the, the educational levels, the standards of the Western European societies, we should still return to a world where our children and grandchildren can enjoy ever higher the standards of living and comparative success in the modern world, but it requires a lot of work, and the European Union is an obvious framework for that. So I return to principles. Sorry, they're the same principles I had when I was the same age as students here, but there we are. 
probably a mistake to be so unswervingly consistent, I think, um, so some of you have certainly responded to events. Uh, might have uh, done me rather better at times, uh, but I, 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 I remain utterly convinced of that. And I live in the middle of, uh, that's what I've already said, quite the maddest period of turbulence in, in, in my political career that I've ever seen. And I can't answer the only question that matters, how the hell is it all going to work out? I couldn't even tell you where the British government's going to be by the end of next week. <laughs> anything that I've talked about, nor could any member of that government. So I, I, I hope uh, I haven't caused too much confusion by leaving you on that rather downbeat note. Certainly on these sort of subjects. I, I wasn't actually as much having in mind the very difficult referendum you have, but at least that is on a non party political, non political subject. Um, but, but to put a huge, complex, all embracing question to a yes no reply, when within it are hundreds of other questions affecting your relationships with the outside world for the next 50 years is ridiculous, particularly when nobody talked about the subject sensibly uh, in the national media all the way through the campaign. I'm not persuaded that a second referendum, particularly on something like an international trade deal, because I've taken part in negotiating, trying to negotiate some international trade deals, it's a specialist subject. So the average ordinary sane member of the human race, if you talk about an international trade deal for more than five minutes, a certain glazing effect takes place. It is a highly technical, complex subject. So to put that and all the other things we're going to have to agree to a referendum would be crazy, absolutely crazy. Even more people would vote expressing protest about some other subject than did in the last referendum. So I'm against it. And I also say to my friends who say, oh, you must support us in the second referendum. Yeah, you know, because it's the only way we can reverse it. The voice of the people can only do anything and reverse the voice of the people and all that. And I say, well, what happens if we win? I suppose on the other side, they say, let's make it best of three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think you've demonstrated? Uh, no, none of the committed politicians will change their minds, none of the reputable ones. Boris might. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, if a referendum goes the other way. I believe in parliamentary democracy. You're accountable to the public, and your constituents can damn well fire you if they disapprove of the way you've been exercising your judgment and voting. Uh, and I hope Parliament, anyway, is it Parliament might reverse it, but you make out I've given up on that. But now I'm not in favour of a referendum. Uh, and uh, it's just conceivable that, as I think this, this Parliament has got four years to go, we might still not have reached the end of all these negotiations by four years' time. It's just possible another general election and a general desire to get on and do something else and for God's sake, everybody's bored stiff by going on about Brexit. It just might be possible for Parliament to take back control of it and, uh, a, 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 and some government to move on. But the, Because the frustrating thing is that if you had a secret ballot in the House of Commons, people just voted their first opinion, between two thirds and three quarters would be in favour of staying in the European Union. The, the vast majority of members of Parliament are personally opposed to 
Brexit. The vast majority, even bigger majority, are in favour of staying in the supermarket, staying in the customs union, don't mind the European Court of Justice, definitely want an open border and the Good Friday Agreement in Ireland. It's just hysterical politics, events, all the rest of it got them trapped. The reason Parliament's making such a mess of it is it's trying to enact things that almost the vast majority of members of Parliament don't agree with. It. They, they argue against it, they don't want it. But they're, they're trying to fulfill some weird democratic duty to get immersed in this nonsense, keep pushing it forward. Now, uh, and then there was a second question. Now, I'll already give you a small speech, the first one. What was the second part of the question? Do you think, because of the force in the community, because they're hard, it might cause a break Both parties are in serious danger for the reasons I described. They are both very serious and slit. Ironically, I think the Labour Party is in more danger than the Conservative Party. First, it's the Labour Party is always split by ideology and it's always on the brink of breaking. Uh, a, 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 and. Uh, but I think it really is. I, I think there are a lot of Labour members of Parliament who would be more shocked at the idea of Jeremy Corbyn, with his economic views, becoming Prime Minister, you know, than I would be, you know, or at least as shocked as I would be. They, they don't want to see that. Um, and and they, they have a tradition of always being split uh, and, and always uh, factions and things. Because you know. the, the, every party has a tradition of being a party of power and desperately reaching compromise in order to make itself a natural party of government. This is the stiffest test they've faced for several generations in doing that. We, we manage that at Maastricht. Uh, this makes Maastricht look like a bit of a tea party. So there is a risk. Neither party will want to. Bear in mind British political parties, because of our voting system, are uh, anyway broad coalitions, pre-packed coalitions. Any other country, any other country with a PR system, the Labour Party wouldn't be one party. We wouldn't be one party. Tony Blair and George Galloway were in the same political party for 20 years. I mean, it's just ludicrous. I could give you some equally ludicrous conservative examples of people who'd be my parliamentary colleagues in my party in the years I've been in the Conservative Party. We pre-packed ourselves both parties do try to and compromise, apply collective discipline, and then the electorate vote for a pre packed coalition government. But both coalitions run immense, immense strain, and, and will continue to be so because all kinds of subjects we haven't even looked at yet. Uh, Ronnie, do you still? Oh, yes, my mention is that how many of the supporters of the League campaign? Do you think sincerely believed in the European Union and how many of them do you think just for political position? Well, the vast majority believe it. There, there, there is a movement. So, I mean, they are fervent, some of them. Uh, absolutely fervent. And I have, the, most of them are perfectly good friends of mine. The, the ones who've been advocating this for 20, 30 years, People like Bill Cash, who's still in the House of Commons, he's in mind. Each of us knows that the other quite passionately holds to his views. Each of us knows we're not going to convert each other. And so I've got every respect for his views. And they all, basically, they do know something about the subject. They, 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 they do sound off. So most at the top, there are one or two who are a bit opportunist. And around about, uh, there are people who, I mean, political parties only work in any parliamentary democracy, not just the British, but any other, including the Irish, I'm sure. You need a certain section of your party to be trying to work out all the time which side they think is winning, and to join that for the time being. They're not held in very high regard by the others, but it, is, it, it helps keep the whole show on the road, uh, and enables you to deliver things when you get going. So there are a few of those. But some of the fervent ones have been fervent for as long as I can remember. Ian Duncan Smith, for example. Uh, 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 is just a passionate, passionate believer. He's always believed. He, 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 yes, he and I you know, debate it often. We, we still find ourselves taking part of the House of Commons. He's all right. And then I was surprised by one or two who joined the movement on the eve of. Uh, so were they. I think some of the Brexiteers were rather surprised to discover 
people who suddenly presented themselves and told them they were now their leader, mm -hmm. uh, who neither side had expected to be on that side of the argument. But you probably guessed who I have in mind, but I'm sure he's trying to find some arguments to reinforce his new conviction. <laughs> Now that Britain's rapidly coming to resemble Ireland as was, well, you know, the small, conservative, eccentric, inward looking country divorced from the rest of Europe, um, what on earth is the role of Britain going for? What? What? what um, if, sorry, I'm going to Sorry, sorry. Uh, what, what, what could the role of Britain going forward possibly be now that European Britain seems to be sinking around the place? Well, if, if, if I think we are leaving, we are going to have to decide what our foreign policy is and what our role is and uh, where, we, where, where we need to try to exercise some influence because we have definite interests at stake. I think we, we have to accept that our role in the world will have been minimalized, but we still are quite an important member of the Western uh, Alliance and the Western Alliance remains important to us. Uh, so trying to keep the American Alliance in some sensible uh, thing, which it is not just involved going along, agreeing with what Donald Trump said last week. Uh, it does involve working seriously in the long term on making sure that we can demonstrate we are making a sensible contribution to our own defence, that we uh, do regard ourselves as having mutual interests, and actually we can reinforce the more sensible views of the political class, the defence and military establishment there about how we look after our interests. That becomes, it does become more important to us if we go out. I think in most of the major issues, I've touched on some, our views coincide almost exactly with those of the Irish and every other European member state. So without being a member, politically, we can ally ourselves very closely. And every now and again, British governments do uh, try to make a demonstration of, you know, agreeing with President Macron and, and to the Merkel and something and so on. And uh, uh, we, we have, I'm going to say, stuck to being with them on the Paris climate change and the Iran nuclear agreement and so on. And we don't have to be members to try to be, will be a bit of an add-on, but to encourage them to develop, because we've got really strong European positions on the things I touched on, Putin and so on. Uh, we will have to acknowledge there are parts of the world where we don't matter much anymore. Uh, our defence capability will have to be designed to actually work out where are our strengths, where our allies actually benefit from our contributing there. Uh, our strengths now were well, well, even, well, even useful to the Americans, not just as political allies, are uh, our security, GCHQ, <coughs> intelligence operation cyber warfare we're not bad at, uh, and uh, special forces. Now, we, we, we have mainstream forces, which are pretty good, quite useful, but you've got to design them for what we're likely to be doing now, which is fighting stray guerrilla, guerrilla warfare in, in hospitable places uh, in and around the Middle East, Africa, when there is no other way we can progress but getting involved in military things. And in foreign affairs, we've got to find realistic ways of producing stability in some of these places. The other thing I didn't mention in passing, we are all facing a terrible immigrant crisis, a genuine immigrant crisis. It is not Romanian nurses or German academics who are the immigrant crisis in England. It's the same immigrant crisis that has hit the entire the rest of Europe, which is the flooding of the poor out of Africa, Middle East, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, largely fleeing anarchy, warfare, chaos, who suddenly realize that they can get into Europe, settle down, make a better life at least, in Sweden, Germany, or the United Kingdom, or I suspect, Vietnam. We're humanitarian, we should preserve our values, we should, we do offer refuge. We should deal in a civilized way with young men whose only fault is they're poverty stricken and desperate. The truth is, 
much that I, wel I, you know, I, I welcome all thoughts behind Angela Merkel's statement. Angela Merkel is my great political hero, the best politician in Western Europe that Europe has produced in my lifetime. But the, 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 um, she overdid it. We cannot take every inhabitant of Somalia, Ethiopia, so on, into this country. Ethics isn't always easy. We do have to find some civilized way of handling this, stopping the flood, deciding who you are under a compelling humanitarian duty to welcome and integrate and have, who you're not. And there isn't one of the European countries that is going to resolve that. And unless we all work together, moments of short term things like plugging the hole in Libya, uh, controlling the Mediterranean, and reach some civilized way of dealing with the vast numbers of people who are not aware of the continent, uh, and actually cooperating better in enforcing laws with, I would emphasize, for somebody like me, laws with a defensible, ethical, humanitarian uh, content to them, but not persuading people there's probably some control. That's a huge problem, where things are a bit better than they were three years ago, not much. Ireland's very relevant to that. Ireland, I mean, uh, smuggling has never stopped on the Irish border. It does quite well. It used to do marvellously in my youth. The open border has done a great deal of damage to uh, quite a bit of outsiders. Quite a lot of outsiders come in the smuggle. If you have an open border and one side's in the single market and the other's not, it, uh, uh, it'll be the smuggling capital of the world. You know, people make more. <laughs> and it won't just be Irishmen. I mean, others will come in. Uh, it's, it's very popular routine for Albanians, I'm told at the moment. Uh, there, there are plenty of uh, people smugglers uh, getting various people into, into Ireland and then over the border uh, and then over the Irish Sea. So if you've got the money, you can get in. We, we have between about 400,000 and a million undocumented illegal immigrants in the United Kingdom. And they will make all this bloody fuss about German academics, as I say. It, 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 it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, 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 and nobody knows what to do about it. Uh, 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 and so the big problem, quite a large part, I think, of achieving some political common sense and stability and social stability in the next few years is how are we all going to work together to do with that? And that's working with Europeans. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, uh, two questions. So, um, just given the noticeable shift in uh, driven support towards Conservative Party. You give them the drift of support towards where? Towards the uh, Conservative Party since the election of 2017. Uh, and uh, sort of new information that's emerging in relation to the nature of Labour leaders. Um, I used to work with the British Labour Party in terms of the, as a head target for their uh, analysis division. And I can see that I think the party's probably going to get off the fence in relation to. Uh, I can't hear all this. Sorry, I believe that the party's probably more likely to get off the fence in relation to. Well, that's key. I, 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 the, the opinion polls at the moment on party allegiance, starting that, are pretty meaningless. I don't. I think the one thing that the Conservative Party is home united on, together with our strange allies and democratic unionists, is, is we don't want a general election. And we've also got a funny piece of legislation which is meant to have a fixed term parliament. So I think this parliament might conceivably last for more than four years. It, I think this could go on. Then you touch on what kind of cross-party movement is there going to be? And of course, on both sides, there is this struggle uh, for where the leadership is going to go, either standing up against one wing or the other, or actually making a concession to one wing or another. And this is a very lively debate inside the Labour Party. Plenty I take no part in the discussions between Labour Remainers uh, and Jeremy Corbyn and his allies, but uh, I'm sure a lot of them go off. Uh, my opinion is the Labour Party might unite around remaining in the customs union. The reason being, Jeremy's against the single market. I've already said that's a capitalist plot, that's just big business. It's a, it's, it's, it's never, if you can get John McDonald to agree to that, I mean, you go up and then your powers of persuasion are just magical. You're, you're never going to get John for a thousand years to agree to that. 
Uh, it's a sort of big hate that uh, should be put up. Uh, the, 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 the customs union, because no Tory has anything against being a customs union, no economic argument is used. It's just apparently we've got to leave it so we can have these marvellous new trading agreements with every other country in the world. And you can't do that unless you leave customs union. I think these other trading agreements are a complete illusion. Countries I've been dealing with for years are apparently now waiting just to throw their markets open to us with no rules, no agreement, no, just, just feel free. Uh, they, they will. But if that's the only Tory reason for leaving the customs union. There is no Conservative whose economic views say you shouldn't have customs unions, you should have customs barriers at borders with friendly countries. Now, they're all against that, and none more against it than more friendly uh, Brexiteers, so uh, that's fine. Uh, so, so the, the of trade agreements with other capitalist countries, he's, he's against them. Uh, you sign all kinds of rules, which mean you have to admit all kinds of goods and services without any control over them. If they're not complying with your government's plan, you still have to buy them. The left were arguing against the EU-US TTIP, which I was involved with on the fringes. We were getting absolutely nowhere. America is quite a protectionist country before ever Donald Trump came along. Uh, but but the, 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 the the British left said it was all a plot to privatise the National Health Service. They, they were attacking the, the EU-US TTIP on what I thought, even by the standards of hard left, in my opinion, were quite the most eccentric reasons I'd ever heard of. Well, why not? They all believed it. Uh, and he, he didn't want any trade agreements with all these funny countries. Uh, it, they inhibit your power to command your own economy. So I think they might get their hard left leadership to reach an agreement that the whole party can be united We stay in the customs union. And then what you're asking me, what are the prospects of people like me getting more than 11 Conservatives to say, you know, it's now or never. Brace yourself for the Daily Mail. You'll have a phone call from your Conservative Association chairman, but he's very, very old, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, a, and a lot of the public are, are, are you know, will play the great sigh of relief if at least we could take this elementary step. We can all go on about that we don't need the lorry parks at Dover, we don't need to train thousands of customs men, which apparently we are somewhere. I think you can sell it to the public. That is conceivable. But that is me indulging in fancy. But you write, ask the right question. How many... I, I at the moment have got to build a, an amendment down to this withdrawal bill uh, that we stay in the customs union. So it'll come up in that, but it'll, it'll come in, there's a the more relevant one that comes up in a trade bill. Uh, but the only two people, I've got half the Labour Party on my amendment, but otherwise it's me and Anna Subri. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'll have 50 come up and say, well, of course, I agree, really. I mean, you were very good, I do hope you win, and all that. But then we'll get there, we'll see. Well, the best possible uh, post-Brexit relationship will be if we're in something approaching the Norwegian situation, uh, which means we, we, we do have an open border. Uh, we are pretty well in the, something that looks like the single market with our in the customs union and so on. Uh, so that both of us will benefit economically enormously from doing that because both of us, particularly in Northern Ireland, the UK, but the South, the South of all the other EU countries would be the most badly affected if it all breaks down. We have no, in my opinion, a trading arrangements. So, uh, and our arrangements could well continue. And I think you would be, we would hope that the Republic of Ireland would produce governments which were our, one of our closest friends and a close source of cooperation and just in the European Union. You would just, uh, Actually, I think the Republic 
because it is rather shameful that nobody gave any regard to the Republic of Ireland and the Irish or Northern Ireland either. And we were debating the referendum in England. I think the importance of Ireland to us would be greatly magnified. And we ought to be natural allies. And, 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 and I cannot see in the world of real politique any divergence of practical interest between the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom, unless, of course, we allow people to start staring at old quarrels. But uh, with the old quarrels, I hope, dead, buried, it's going to be a long process to heal all of that. Not that Irish politics are hardly normal. Uh, but, but, but uh, you know, we're going in the right direction. Everybody wants to, half the population wants to. And, and we're just natural allies. It's not just geographic proximity. Uh, uh, we're both naturally liberal democracies, we would all, all the rest of it. Yeah. 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 Um, I was lucky enough to have a few dealings with you when I worked as a journalist at Westminster for a long time. I've been back home in Ireland for two or three years, and I have to say that having seen a lot of the characters who are now driving the Brexit on the side of the government, I'm increasingly dismayed. Uh, to me, David Davis either doesn't do his homework or if he does. David Davis, if I just run through briefly, David Davis either doesn't do his homework or if he does, he forgets the next morning and puts his foot into it, notably on sectoral analysis and on the Irish border, which caused a lot of reaction here in December. Boris Johnson, I knew as a journalist, for a very good company, but I wouldn't trust him for a moment, and I think he would lose. Was he in favour of leaving the European Union then? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I mean, Fox always <coughs> overestimated his popularity within, his appeal to the public, and his popularity within the Conservative Party, which was exposed every time he stood for the election. If Rhys Mogg is genuinely considered as a possible leader of the Conservative Party, I think you can write off the Conservative Party for the next 10 or 12 years. And Theresa May is hopelessly out of her depth. I wonder if you disagree with any of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, I probably, no, I mean, I've been addressing, addressing his, his distinguished audience very, very, very candidly now. Because I don't see any point in coming here giving you some sort of standard thing, saying, oh, it's the best, the best of all possible worlds. And secret, there's a secret plan that's going to produce some uh, great thing. Uh, so uh, you, you've said those things. I'm not I strongly challenge, uh, shall I say. I thought you were going to produce a solution at the end. Um, a lot of it goes back to the, it's not happened in, I think Ireland is, is comparatively free of the malaise which has hit just about every other Western democracy. We used to have quite serious elections. Most people in most Western countries on both sides of the Atlantic had an instinctive political loyalty which they would occasionally change if they got either very attracted to the other side or very annoyed. Uh, but by and large, they judged them according to whether they just liked, they thought they were competent, like their general political position and, 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 and so on. And, and you know, my youth, 3% swing is regarded as dramatic. Now, particularly under the age of 50, the political parties are hugely unpopular with the vast majority of people who wouldn't have anything to do with any of them. There is an almost adolescent, cynical contempt for the political class, all of whom are totally disregarded. Uh, life has been changing very rapidly in a very complicated fashion and various sections of society, not surprisingly particularly amongst the elderly, just have had enough and don't feel able to cope with it, particularly if they themselves have not done very well in recent years and the recession of course has damaged a lot of people on ordinary incomes and ordinary risen very badly indeed, irreversibly on both sides of the Irish Sea. Uh, and that is producing a rash of curious political outbursts in most Western countries. Opinion polls are useless because most people don't make their mind up which way they're going to vote until about two days before polling day, if not when they're walking into the polling station. All depends what particular source of anger is uppermost in their mind in many cases when they go <coughs> to the polling station. And they... Celebrity culture, 
has taken over everywhere. So the, the celebrities and the personalities matter more on the issues, almost, in very many places. And the celebrities, the politicians able to best take advantage of this anarchic political movement, which there's still 60% of the population who are the old-fashioned types like me, who still feel very strongly left to centre, right to centre, know why they belong to a Fina Foyle, know why they belong to the Liberal Party, whatever it happens to be. But 40% is too many who are in the mood I describe. So either right-wing, loudmouth idiots, <laughs> left-wing sort of strange, unworldly ideologues, uh, certainly people who don't have had anything to do with political office in their life, um, anybody who annoys the political establishment, anybody who has a simple solution, so it's all the fault of the damn Mexicans, it's all the fault of Brussels, in France it'll all be alright if we send all the Arabs back, uh, they have an amazing following and they may not sweep away and in you know, five star movement in, in Italy which is I'm glad to say no longer leaving the polls. I never thought I'd be praying for people to vote for Berlusconi. This has happened everywhere. Uh, absolutely everywhere. Uh, and Ireland's one of the least affected by it. And, uh, and you keep getting ever stranger paradoxes of it. The, Boris Johnson and Jacob rees mogg are really creations of the media because they're such exotic personalities. They're both quite nice guys. They actually, you know, they're Jacobs, but they're both, both of them, they put their mind to it. They're highly intelligent guys. They're not idiots. Uh, but they have a persona they've developed. And I do know quite a number of old Italians. You can't be a conservative politician without like a lot of them. Now, the only old Italians nowadays that have this persona, which is kind of theatrical version of what old Italians must have been like in the 1890s. <laughs> so they, 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 and so they suddenly leap to national prominence. You know, all you've got to be is completely one off like Jacob Rees Mogg, and certainly the right wing newspapers will start talking about the next Prime Minister, but two, simply because uh, the television producers cannot resist uh, these extraordinary, you know, they're, they're, they're not ordinary people. Um, uh, and the uh, <coughs> mainstream politicians seem to have to get in control. The French were the lucky ones. The French were remarkably lucky. Marine Le Pen was too nasty even for the French, <laughs> uh, although they were quite determined to ditch all their established politicians, the Blancs, the Sarkozy's, the, all these ex-prime ministers who were appearing again, uh, uh, and the established parties. They were for the dustbin. And then suddenly, this chap Macron, who had been a politician but hardly anybody knew that, uh, emerges with a brand new political party sounds off in exotic ways and curses the political establishment or the rest of it. And the French are in the good fortune of having somebody who turns out to be an economic liberal, a social liberal, and obviously does take the job quite seriously. Leading France, he's now trying to lead Europe for us all. But uh, I mean, I'm not from Macron, I was French. Uh, but whether he's actually up to it, what he's going to deliver, people like me, holding their breath, because if he fails, we're, we're doomed. You know, they're, 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 nobody can produce a, 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 a centre-right or centre-left politician capable of delivering the, the, the kind of sometimes tough, difficult government decisions required in the modern world if your society, your economy is to thrive. Heaven help us. But it's today's 24 hours, seven days a week media, and it's the journalists, the politicians, and just as much the journalists, we all enter into this hysterical, almost comic parody of politics, dealing with vast historic issues, not very successfully, I think. Um, but, you know, we all look across America, all our fates depend on the most powerful country in the world, the upholder in the end of all the great values. What matters there? Is he ever going to get this wall built in Mexico? And Millions of Americans voted for that. So it could get worse. Um, yeah. Can you talk about, um, about Britain seeking its place in the world um, now that it has 
that is, is leaving the European Union. Um, do you see any role for the Commonwealth in that, our, our, our reinvigorated Commonwealth, which does contain some very powerful countries now? And the yes. second question, outside of Brexit, um, who, who did you admire most in your years in the House of Commons? Oh, there's quite a lot of the Brexiteers are very keen on the Commonwealth, yeah, and, and, uh, and, and they've moved on. I mean, I mean, back in my young day, when we were arguing in 1972, all, all, the, 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 it was all the imperialists who were they, they, they deeply regretted that it had been renamed the Commonwealth, but it was the same thing really. Uh, and uh, the, the argument of the Enoch Powers and so on this world was that our, our role in the world is because of our great international commonwealth, that's where we should be, we, instead of all these people we fought with and against on the, all these foreigners on the continent. Uh, 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 and that's what they were all arguing about. Uh, it's different now, so there are genuinely people who think we, uh, the commonwealth to keep out of our role. I, up to a point, I like the commonwealth. Uh, it is an extremely useful, curious, contact for us, very valuable on occasions. When I was Chancellor of the Exchequer, I found the Commonwealth Finance Minister's meetings extremely useful. We used to hold them shortly before the annual meetings in Washington of the IMF and then the World Bank and so on, and sometimes before key G7s. Because uh, you, you could try to organise and mobilise as much support as you could inside the Commonwealth, because although we're multiracial, very diverse, the politics are very diverse, or multi-continental, there is a certain, certain continuity of values. Every again, there's a startling one that you really do have to expel, but the, and the big ones certainly hold together quite well. The, the key, I discovered things about the Commonwealth. The key is it's dominated by India. We call it the British Commonwealth, but we're not the biggest and most important member of the Commonwealth. Certainly not in the eyes of the other members. And the other members, the actual meetings, if you all go with the finance ministers or all the heads of state together, they're quite odd because there are vast numbers of Caribbean islands. Uh, so so you, the, 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 the actual political success and reflects that their actual weight in, in the country is, is not very great. But a, 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 lot, a lot of the Africans, a lot of the Caribbeans, if you're going to have a natural leader, it's India, which in the old days was a kind of leading neutral country. But the, I, I got on, we had very good Indian comments in my day. I got on my, my opposite members, a man called Mamlehan Singh, who was a great guy. And, and he and I used to attach great value to these Commonwealth meetings. And if we could get the Canadians, the Australians, and the New Zealanders to come, they were the other South Africans. Uh, but some of the other Africans were, were okay. And the Caribbean was fine. Uh, and you could do things there. But it's only up to a point. Because uh, actual interest, the Real Party again, is very different. And Australia and New Zealand have Asian economies. But what matters in, in modern Australia, modern, they've moved on from just being old colonies flogging their products of their settlers uh, back to the mother country. They have not matters to them is relations with China, relations with Japan, their economies are deeply rooted. Australia is wholly dependent on riding iron ore to China. Very nice countries, very good countries. But uh, and the British connection matters to them, but it's and our values are the same. Uh, they're, they're, they're okay uh, the Canadians again, uh, they rather like being close to us because <coughs> the problem with Canada is it's next door to the United States and it's so much smaller than the United States, and they do like somebody else to actually try for the best of balance with their you know perfectly friendly but sometimes careless monster neighbour which overshadows them. And, uh, so you, you, but the idea that our role in the world can be based on some community of interest and you, you, you the other big countries I'm being made, you know, I'm drifting the way Rex Tears do it's talking about the, the old Commonwealth you know, you, 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 Nigeria and South Africa have to play a role in this they're big powerful countries and I'm all in favour of having excellent relationships with both of them. But it's lively, uh, 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 and it's not like having an agreement with Canada. If we do leave, I think you can get trade deals quite quickly with Australia and New Zealand, but it'll be tricky because they're too far away for any great volumes of trade. 
And they're tricky because like the Americans and like the Brazilians, they're still interested in reopening their food exports to us, although it's no longer as dependent as they were. We have quotas on lamb and other agricultural products from both of them. And it's an absolutely precondition, they won't talk to you if you don't lift the quotas on the lamb, which would be quite a challenge for our <coughs> Make it They won't let the other Europeans let it them in, so you, you're going to have more border controls then to stop specific origin and so on. Um, and so you won't get very far, and there's not a lot that we're really looking for we could open up. Most of these countries, what we look for is opening up services. And most countries are extremely protectionist on services. There's no one more reactionary than lawyers, and there's no one more, uh, I'm a lawyer, uh, and uh, there's no more, more protectionist than anybody in the financial services industry. 